Kia ora, good evening, thank you very much Dave. Um, thank you everybody for being here. I dare say there's thousands of other things you could have done tonight, but you're in the right place. That's great, thank you for that. I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Shall we pray together? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we gather this evening to better understand aspects of our culture. We pray, Holy Spirit, for your presence, that you will be our real teacher tonight. Furnish in each of us deeper truths of your kingdom so that we are better equipped to serve you in this world. Amen. Amen. Last month we heard from Joe Fleener. Hands up if you were here. Okay, that was, I thought that was a superb meeting. And um, Joe was looking at Freud and contemporary sexuality. Um, and in many ways what I'm going to present to you this evening uh, dovetails in with what Joe was saying. So if you weren't here, I would thoroughly recommend that you find that podcast that is available today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Freud and the person I'm talking about tonight, Karl Marx, are intellectuals whose ideas impact wider humanity in a grand, on a grand scale. I want to say, first up, intellectuals are a dangerous species. I really think they are. Um, who is more significant in terms of their impact between Freud and Marx? I will offer a view on that shortly. If you've seen the abstract, I've mentioned there a number of contemporary social movements, the Occupy movement, climate change activism, LGBTQIA, um, and Black Lives Matter, among many others. Now, what do they have in common? Oh, they have many things in common, I think, but uh, Marxism, to my mind, features really prominently in them because it envisages a radically different future based on the deconstruction of existing reality. Contemporary concepts such as tolerance, diversity and inclusion, which I refer to as a neo-pagan trinity, and the associated ideas of decolonization, unteach racism, and a whole lot more, I believe, owe a huge debt to Marxism. Whose interests are served is a question that will pop up from time to time. It's a commonly heard policy question. I believe it's pure Marxism, pure in inverted commas, because the answers assume a worldview of conflict between powerful controlling interests who seek to reproduce their own advantage, but in the process, marginalize less powerful groups. See, there's no assumption or presupposition of harmony or unity or working together. It's always about conflict. So let's uh, get into Marxism. I want to begin talking about Marx, the man himself, and his theory. Then I want to talk about neo-Marxism and contemporary Marxism. So my, my guiding question is, uh, whose interests are served and why Marxism hasn't become Marxism? Karl Marx, the person, was born in 1818. He lived through most of the 19th century. He died in 1883. He was a prolific author. The two main works that I will mention here um, are the Communist Manifesto, which he published in 1848 with his offsider Frederick Engels. And the other main one, of course, that I think many of you will be familiar with is Das Kapital, which was published in 1867, Marx's more mature works. This book here, has been really helpful. You know, there are some books that really shape us, aren't there? This is called Intellectuals by Paul Johnson. Has anyone seen or read this book? Okay, Bob has. Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> this is a superb book, and I found this really life-changing. It did, I have to say, create a suspicion of intellectuals. His basic thesis is that all these people who are known for their ideas but what were they like morally? How well equipped were public intellectuals to advise humanity about everything? 
That's a good question. So I do recommend that book. And I want to um, answer that question I posed a moment ago. Who's more influential, Freud or Marx? Well, here's what Paul Johnson has to say. And I quote, Karl Marx has had more impact on actual events, as well as on the minds of men and women, than any other intellectual in modern times. The reason for this is not primarily the attraction of his concepts and methodology, though both have strong appeal to unrigorous minds, but the fact that his philosophy has been institutionalized in two of the world's largest countries, Russia and China, and their many satellites. If ideas have consequences, we would have to agree, Marx is right up there. Marx was to the social sciences what Darwin was to the natural sciences or Freud to psychology. They all exerted an almost incalculable influence on subsequent intellectual developments. Marx was born in Prussia on the 5th of May 1818 and he died on the 14th of March 1883. His father Heinrich Marx, a Jewish name, was a lawyer. Marx Sr. was the son of a rabbi who himself was the child of a rabbi so there's a long history of uh, Jewish heritage there. His mother Henrietta had also descended from a rabbi. That's interesting. Heinrich Marx, Marx's father, became a Protestant following a Prussian decree of 1816 which banned Jews from the higher ranks of law and medicine. The children were baptised in 1824 and Marx, get this, became a passionate Christian, apparently, following his confirmation at age 15. He was the only son in his family to survive into middle age. He married a woman called Jenny von Westphalen, who was descended from the Scot a Scottish Earl of Argyll. Despite his supposed uh, sympathies with the proletariat, Marx was actually quite chuffed about being married to, uh, to um, Scottish aristocracy. Marx attended Bonn and later Berlin University. He became thoroughly disinterested in Jewish causes or education, but developed traits characteristic of a certain type of Talmudic scholar. There was a tendency to accumulate vast masses of half-assimilated material and plan encyclopedic works which were never completed. He had an extreme assertiveness and an irascibility towards other scholars. Once he said of himself, I am a machine condemned to devour books. He was a classical scholar in the prevailing Hegelian mode. He studied history, philosophy and law. He gained a doctorate in 1841. His thesis was on the philosophy of Epicurus, and then he became a journalist. According to Paul Johnson, he became an eschatological writer, weaving three main strands into his work. Marx the poet, firstly, Marx the journalist, and thirdly, Marx the moralist, a three-chord strand running through the man and his writings. He had a very pessimistic anthropology, a hatred and a fascination with violence. The apocalyptic theme of an immense impending catastrophe becomes woven into a political vision in which the proletariat, the worker, the working class, assumes the hero's mantle. If there is a salvific figure in Marxism, it is the proletariat. In 1856 he said, history is the judge, its executioner is the proletariat. He always claimed a scientific basis for his ideas. I guess it gave him extra legitimacy in the modernist period. But the poetic thread running through Marx works backwards from his stance as a political economist, seeking evidence that made it inevitable. He had a, an ambivalent attitude towards the facts, and he found those that fitted. According to the philosopher Karl Jaspers, Marx was interested in vindication, not investigation. He was very skilled at using and borrowing aphorisms from other writers. The proletariat have nothing to lose but their chains was not his. Religion is the opium of the people was not his. Workers of the world unite 
was not his. But he did say this, religion is only the illusory sun around which man revolves until he begins to revolve around himself. It's a powerful statement, isn't it? When I read that, I think back to Genesis 3. Human rebellion against God doesn't create a vacuum. We put ourselves in the place of where God was or should be. Marx also needed a moral impulse. He developed a hatred of money lenders and capitalists, many of course who were Jewish, and he was skillfully able to integrate fashionable anti-Semitism with a hatred of institutions. And of course, highly suspicious of established authority. He managed to penetrate to bar rooms where people chit chat. So from the grand world of ideas down to sort of grassroots where people live their lives. He suffered what's been called a global gigantism, always stressing the global nature and applicability of the process that he's describing. There is no empirical evidence, however, to suggest that Marx talked with peasants. <coughs> he knew very few landowners or financiers. He never set foot in a mill, a factory or other industrial workplace and was actually hostile to many revolutionaries who did. See, and I'll pause here. The world of ideas. When we elevate ideas <coughs> over the welfare of people, you're on a dangerous pathway the tyranny of ideas. <coughs> it is a fact and in some ways a melancholy fact that massive works of the intellect do not spring from the abstract workings of the brain and the imagination. They are deeply rooted in personality. Marx is an outstanding example <coughs> of this principle. I've been talking about Marx the man, but I hope that you, as I go on, will be able to see connections with how Marxism has evolved. Marx had a taste for violence, an appetite for power, an inability at a personal level to handle his money and finances. He sponged off Engels as he got older. He had a tendency to exploit those around him. He had an alcohol problem. He had at least two mistresses and five children. He ate spiced food, <coughs> smoked heavily, rarely <coughs> washed and suffered from carbuncles. Probably made him a bit angry, <laughs> even more angry. <coughs> he said this in his theses on Feuerbach. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And boy, has Marxism changed it. <coughs> on one hand, he was influenced by the idealism of uh, George Hegel. That idealist philosophy is sort of up in the clouds somewhere. But he did like the way Hegel conceptualised the present reality, the opposition to that, and an outcome. Thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, and synthesis. And the synthesis that emerges feeds back to a new thesis. He liked that from Hegel. But he liked the materialism of Ludwig Feuerbach. Instead of the usual mechanistic notion of nature, Marx returned to the Hegelian notion of dialectics, which is actually a key Platonic notion, it comes from the Greek to dialogue, to argue or to contend. So Marx combined the dialectics of Hegel with the materialism modified from Feuerbach to create what he called dialectical materialism. Very significantly, dialectical materialism rejected the transcendent in favour of a materialist view of reality. The essence of this was a struggle between ideas, opposing forces, and their resolution. Marx proposed a conflict worldview, which he said is the motor of history, the antagonism and struggle for power between groups. Grounding this idea of dialectical materialism in the real world, he called it historical materialism. Thesis, the status quo, the present reality that we know, there's always going to be pushback or contending or even rebellion, and from that will come an outcome. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. 
Marx identifies five systems through history, the primitive community, the slave state, the feudal state, the capitalist system, which is what he knew in his life and times, and the socialist society of the future. Now, many of us will have read Charles Dickens and we can identify with the worldview that he's describing. The mid 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, Britain is the workshop of the world, and there was some real empirical basis to what Marx was theorizing. There was class antagonism between owners of production and workers of production. The owners he called the bourgeoisie, and the workers, who were far greater in number, of course, were the proletariat. <coughs> Exploitation comes for Marx in what he called the theory of surplus value. So when something is made or produced and there's a profit made, the workers get a little bit of money, but the person sitting up the top puffing a cigar is going to be accumulating capital. He saw that as very exploitative and there would be inherent tensions, there would be antithesis here, which according to Marx would eventually result in a workers revolution and the outcome, the synthesis, in the socialist scheme of things was to be a classless society. So in classical Marxism, there is a primacy of the economic system. But later Marxists, and Marx died in 1883, and then uh, I think Engels died about 1895 from memory, and then the dawn of the 20th century, and we know that that led to World War I. Um, people who subscribed to Marxism after the death of the man himself were wanting to retain the thrust and the radical revolutionary sort of emphasis of Marx and Marxism, but the reality around them was telling them something different. And they started to see and theorise that just focusing on the economy and uh, the tension between owners of production and workers of production was too reductionistic. Economic monism, as some have described it. <coughs> Certainly it was an exploitative economy that created injustice and class antagonism, but there's a lot more going on. The central question is this. Why in the early 20th century, and just after <coughs> World War I, I'm thinking, or around World War I and after that, the Great War, why was capitalism so durable? Why did it survive? In fact, it was thriving in certain places. Unionism was something Marx himself didn't like because it's a trade-off. It's not addressing for him the essence of class antagonism. It's a sort of a mediation middle road. He didn't like that. So, and of course, towards the end of World War I, we had a direct application of Marxism in Lenin's new order in Russia, which became the USSR in 1923. <coughs> so, the prefix before Marxism, neo-Marxism, emerged in the 1920s. There were two main problems. The first one was the durability of capitalism and the advent of multinationalists, People like Henry Ford in America, the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, and many others. Capitalism was thriving. These supposed inherent contradictions were not causing the system to fall over. Quite the opposite, and of course you had unionism there too, which was not for Marx and Marxists addressing the real core of the problem, but it's a trade-off. So why haven't the contradictions and exploitations of the capitalist order led to a worldwide Workers' revolution. That's the question that people who were still interested in the Marxist project were asking themselves. And at this juncture, there are two significant developments. There's probably hundreds, really, but two that I'll identify. The first is the emergence of what was called the Frankfurt School Marxists. Um, as the Nazi regime became more prominent from the 1920s onwards, Many Marxists, who were Jews, of course, fled Europe. Um, and they fled to places like the United States, which were a safe haven. And they continued their work there with relative freedom. So the, the Frankfurt School Marxists, as they were called, 
as they set up camp in the US and other places. The second hugely significant development was the emergence of an Italian Marxist called Antonio Gramsci. Who's heard of Gramsci? Okay, a few people. He uh, died in 1937. He was imprisoned by Mussolini in the island of Sardinia. And he was physically unwell. And he scribbled his notes, apparently, on toilet paper and they were smuggled out. They became his notebooks, Gramsci's notebooks. Um, we cannot underestimate the significance, the later impact of Antonio Gramsci. Why was he so significant? Because for Marxists, he shifted the attention in Marxist thought onto not just the economy and class antagonisms between owners and workers of production, but he looked at the social sphere, the cultural superstructure, if you like. And he came up with this. This will start to sound very familiar to you now, especially if you've been in education and you've been awake for the last 20 years. Capitalist societies reproduce the conditions of capital because the ruling class controls the institutions and thereby mediates and popularizes its own ideas. You get that? Yeah. This results in a control or a hegemony of the ruling class. Now, hegemony is an important word for neo-Marxists, as is the idea of cultural reproduction. And so from the 1920s onwards, the neo-Marxist focus is on the institutions of cultural reproduction, moving away from the primacy of the economic, as in classical Marxism, to focus on the centrality of ideology and its formation in schools, churches, and the family. Those three institutions have been under sustained attack by neo-Marxists through most of the latter part of the 20th century, the school, the church, and the family. I have here um, a book called The Essential Works of Marxism. It's a misnomer, of course, because nothing about Marxism is essential. But this is what the man himself said. This is from the Communist Manifesto, and I'm just going to read a few quotes. He said, abolition of the family, even the most radical flare-up at this infamous proposal of the communists. Do you charge us, Marx asks, with wanting to stop the exploitation of children by their parents? To this crime, we plead guilty. Jars, doesn't it? The bourgeois claptrap about the family and education, about the hallowed relationship between parent and child becomes all the more disgusting, the more that, as a result of modern industry, all family ties among the proletarians are torn asunder and their children transformed into simple articles of commerce and instruments of labour. And get this one. This is quite chilling. This is still from the Communist Manifesto. Communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and all morality. Instead of constituting them on a new basis, it therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experience. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional property relations. No wonder that its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. You get the flip. There's, a, there's an anger in all this, isn't there? There really is. That's Marx's own writings. So, a resurgence of neo-Marxism after the end of World War II, and especially during the tumult of the 1960s in the West, which was, as many of you know, a decade of great dislocation. The maturity of baby boomers, the advent of TV, the Vietnam War, war rock and roll, etc. We could go on. And both classical and neo-Marxism appealed because of their inherent distrust of the establishment, the traditional authority structures and institutions. Mm -hmm. It provided a ready-made framework for shaking an angry fist raging against the machine. Marx's own writings, as we've just seen, for anyone who cared to read them, were and still are thoroughly radical, in my view. 
One neo-Marxist I want to mention by name is a character called Herbert Marcuse. He was a Frankfurt School Marxist living in America. In 1969, during the heat of the battle, the cultural battle, Marcuse wrote about liberating tolerance. Now, if you're taking notes, I think you should write this down. Liberating tolerance. Here's what it means for Marcuse. And I quote, It means intolerance against movements from the right, that's capital R, and toleration of movements from the left, capital L. In other words, anything from the left should be totally supported, and anything from the right should be critiqued and pulled down. That was written in 1969 from an article called Repressive Tolerance. And we know what else was happening in this decade. Other centres of what Marxists called radical praxis in the 1960s. Castro in Cuba, Che Guevara in Latin America, the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia in 1968, and communist advances in former colonial empires of the East. For example, British Malaya, French Indochina, Vietnam and Laos, and African states. You see, Marxism is more than just a theory. And then in the 1970s, neo-Marxism graduates to the universities, big time. And we get the emergence of what's called the New Left. There was a French Marxist called Louis Althusser who edited a very significant journal called the New Left Review. And Althusser was a key person in consciousness raising of new social causes, racial minorities, women and other marginalised groups. To my mind, this is where we get the race, gender, class, trinity. Race, gender, class. Race, gender, class. It's everywhere. It's just infused with Marxism. Althusser is also infamous for murdering his wife. He strangled her. They're not very nice people, some of these Marxists. <laughs> okay, so Marxism graduates to the universities. A very significant text published in America in 1976, fueled and aided and abetted by the work of the Frankfurt School, was a book by Samuel Bowles and Herbert, Herbert Gintis called Schooling in Capitalist America. It's a foundational Marxist analysis that was hugely influential. And from this point on, Marxism's impact in educational theory and sociology became par for the course. In 1985, a Jewish Marxist, New Left activist and academic, called Stanley Aronowitz published a book called The Crisis in Historical Materialism, which I have read. Aronowitz argued that Marxism in all its forms was still thoroughly viable, but it needed to adopt and accommodate other revolutionary causes. Boy, that's a prophetic work, isn't it? And so from the 1980s and to the mid-1990s, we see a plethora of politicised causes. You see, Marxism, going back to, to the man himself, envisages conflict between groups. And so society is organised between conflict and groups. Group identity politics. There you are. Mm. We don't see humanity as a whole. We don't speak of civilization anymore because that's colonial. Civilization envisaged at a presuppositional level all humanity being made of the same stuff. You see, if you have group identity politics, you get new tribalisms because you get groups competing and contesting against each other. Yeah. So, the 1980s. Boy, what a decade. The so-called new right also emerges in this decade with Thatcher and Reagan and here in New Zealand, Roger Douglas. Whereas the old right, if we could call it that, consisted of monarchies and aristocrats and families of the landed gentry, the new right rediscovered market principles of economic growth based on Adam Smith's theories and others. And these developments I'm mentioning only because they made neo-Marxists even more irascible. If you like, it was a blue rag to a very angry red bull. <laughs> and even today, in university courses and the humanities, they are still bleating on about the sins of neoliberalism.
That's what they call it. It's a constant whipping boy. In the early 90s, worlds colliding polarised ideologies of right and left. Post-modernity starts to replace the certainties of science and old truths. The Enlightenment truth was replaced with a relativist ethic. It was the end of modernity. It was the end of truth, progress, civilization. I found when I was cleaning up the other day a book, a big book of maps called The March of Man. You just couldn't write a book like that now. It was full of maps. And it had, had historical maps. And it had this assumption that all humanity was sort of moving towards something. It was a grand narrative to history, but no more. We have, in more recent times, the centrality of ideology, media control, and group identity politics. Marxism sat very comfortably alongside other theories of power, and writers such as Michel Foucault, who died in 1984. For Foucault, power dynamics moves way beyond the structures of the economic, which is classical Marxism, way beyond even the ideology of neo-Marxism, through right to the individual. That's where Foucault focuses his analysis of power. And he wrote about systems of punishment, sexuality and medicine. These were all, according to Foucault, new sites of power and control. He called the word, he called them discourses of, now that's a trendy word, isn't it? You know, I'm sick of discourses of power and control. I'm sick of Foucault. I loathe Marxism, by the way, if you haven't gathered that already. <laughs> I really do, because it's a rage against God. And you cannot, to my mind, dress it up as something good and honourable, because it ain't. <laughs> okay, so following Foucault, no overarching meta-narrative. There's no truth. There's no big picture. Rather, there is just a multiplicity of discourses different stories, everything's pluralised, there's nothing singular about the nature of humanity anymore. So we see in Foucault um, a framework for emphasis that emerged in multiculturalism and diversity. However, I mention Foucault because to my mind, behind all this lies an ever adaptable neo-Marxism. Neo-Marxists have an incredible ability to accommodate and adapt. And Aronowitz, who said, look, all these causes, let's come together. That's what Aronowitz was saying in 1985. And boy, he's absolutely on the money. In education, I'll mention a couple of names. Henry Giraud, you may have heard of him. Michael Apple, an American Marxist educator. Very angry individuals. People like Apple are able to embrace post-modernity with open arms while retaining a broad neo-Marxist presuppositional base. And the result of their work, a reinvigorated and devastating critique of contemporary capitalism and an advancement and advocacy of radical deconstructionism. Marxism remains dominant in public policy debates, tertiary social science courses and in the media. It has a proven track record of accommodation of other causes, like Aronowitz was arguing for, and it influences government at all levels. You see, when you use the word social as a prefix, it's Marxism, social democracy. I'd just rather talk about democracy, because I understand that from the Greeks. You put social as a prefix and you're changing it. You're creating Marxism. Justice is something is either just or unjust. True? Yeah? What happens if you put social in front of it? Now it changes it. Think about it. It changes everything, doesn't it? Yeah? I think it does. You might not agree, that's fine. But to my mind it does. Social democracy and social justice creates big government at every turn. And to my mind, all of this is deeply infused with Marxist thought. Now I have two analogies drawing to a close. I'm old enough to remember the old Cromwell. Remember the old Cromwell in Otago? Yeah, yeah there was a confluence. A confluence. Now, that's a great word, I reckon. Yeah. It's coming together of two great rivers. The Kawarau River, fed by the Wakatipu Lake, and, um, and then Lake Hawea and Lake Wanaka. Um, 
And in both cases, the water starts as a small trickle in the mountains. This, these trickles feed into small streams, which feed into larger streams, which feed into rivers, which feed into mighty rivers. And I can remember as a lad standing and uh, looking at the confluence of these two great rivers coming together, very powerful to create the Clutha River. And if you study the Clutha River, it's, uh, it's a very dangerous river. It's claimed many lives. Um, you can see on the surface the water is moving quite slowly and there are little eddies which indicates that underneath there is a massive volume of water moving through. So these rivers are very dangerous. But confluence, Marxism is able to be a confluence and a conduit for all sorts of other ideas that feed into it. That's the first analogy. The second analogy comes from child development. Jean Piaget, the Swiss psychologist, um, has an experiment called conservation, where you take a set volume of water in a container, and you have other shaped containers, and you pour the same volume of water into the different shapes, and it looks, you know, the water looks different. But actually, and Piaget says this is a sign of intellectual development in children, if they can work out it's the same volume of water despite the container shape, then that is a sign of some intellectual maturity. Well, for me, Marxism and neo-Marxism is able to assume the shape of many other causes and feed and infuse them. But it's still neo-Marxism. Marxism has also had a direct influence on the triumph of the therapeutic in our culture. As a philosophy rooted in materialism, its understanding of human nature has led to the contemporary vanity of self-creation. There is an inevitability to this, because if you reject God, it will necessarily lead to an idolatry which exalts the self. We know that as believers. From its origins, Marxism in its classical contemporary forms is ultimately a rage against God. Go back to the writings of the man himself and you'll see where it all starts. Marxism's influence in emphases on equalisation, equity, social justice, indigeneity, diversity and minority causes, especially around sexuality as Joe was talking about last time, have created indeed a tolerance for the left, as Marcuse wrote in 1969, that is, I think, equivalent to a civil religion in our nation. Marxism is replete in government policy, administration, education, schooling, at all levels, and most pervasively in the public consciousness. If you got the flyer for this uh, seminar tonight, there was a picture that I included that showed a different figures wearing a Marxist beard. Did you see that? Did that come through? I don't know if it did or not. Marx is the man in the moon. Marx is the cows walking around. Marx is the woman. Marx is everywhere. So I just used that image, but if you haven't seen it, perhaps not sure what I'm referring to. Okay, drawing to a close now. There are some bold individuals in our nation who stand up and name things for what they are in the public square. One of them is a retired, I think he's retired now, journalist called Carl Defray. In June 2018, he said this in a piece he wrote entitled, Cultural Marxism is Marching into All Areas of Our Lives. This is what Carl said. Neo-Marxism also sets out to create a sense of continuing economic and social crisis, using this as a justification for ever more intrusive state uh, intervention and control. It seeks to undermine our most basic understanding of human nature and society. How we see and interpret the, interpret the world is dismissed by neo-Marxists as a social and political construct, a product of our conditioning. Nothing is fixed, not even the sex we're born with, and nothing has any objective value. Every belief and every value, no matter how soundly based in human experience and observation, is up for question. 
Paradoxically, while the neo-Marxists attack some belief systems as oppressive, Christianity for example, they make excuses for others such as Islam, although it's infinitely more controlling. But don't go looking for ideological consistency in neo-Marxism, you'd be wasting your time. <laughs> I like that, yes, <laughs> that's good. And finally, returning to Paul Johnson, and he's writing about the intellectuals he's surveyed, but uh, I'm applying this thinking in, specifically in relation to Marx and neo-Marxists. He says this at the end of Intellectuals. What conclusions should be drawn? Readers will judge for themselves. But I think I detect, Johnson says, a certain public scepticism when intellectuals stand up to preach to us. A growing tendency among ordinary people to dispute the right of academics, writers and philosophers, enemies though they may be, to tell us how to behave and to conduct our lives. The belief seems to be spreading that intellectuals are no wiser as mentors or worthier as exemplars than the witch doctors or priests of old, and I share that scepticism. A dozen people picked at random on the street are at least as likely to offer sensible views on moral and political matters as are a cross-section of the intelligentsia. But I would go further. One of the principal lessons of our tragic century, which is writing of the 20th century, which has seen so many millions of innocent lives sacrificed to schemes to improve the lot of humanity is this, beware of intellectuals. Not merely should they be kept well away from the levers of power, they should also be objects of particular suspicion when they seek to offer collective advice. Beware committees, conferences, and leagues of intellectuals. Distrust political statements issued from their serried ranks. Discount their verdicts on political leaders and important events. For intellectuals, far from being highly individualistic and non-conformist people, follow certain regular patterns of behavior. Taken as a group, they are often ultra-conformist within the circles formed by whose approval they seek and value. This is what makes them en masse so dangerous, for it enables them to create climates of opinion and prevailing orthodoxies, which themselves often generate irrational and destructive courses of action. Above all, we must at all times remember what intellectuals habitually forget, that people matter more than concepts and must come first. The worst of all despotisms is the heartless tyranny of ideas. That's powerful. And what might be an apologetics response? Well, I want to suggest three things quickly. And then we we'll, might have a break and uh, a cup of tea and come back with some Q&A. Three things. Firstly, awareness. Knowing what's going on. We, I believe we have a, an obligation to be aware of what's going on. Seeing the influence of Marxism around us. As I say, you may disagree. And there are many other intellectuals who've shaped our present reality and created, as Johnson says, prevailing orthodoxies and climates of opinion. But to my mind, I've just seen far too much of it. It is Marxism for me. I think this awareness should also extend to the Christian church because I believe that the church will inexorably drift towards neo-Marxism in cultural matters if it's not vigilant. See, social justice sort of has warm fuzzies about it, doesn't it? In the Catholic tradition, there is perhaps a sense of social justice that might have validity, but you know, when it's bandied about by politicians and bureaucrats, no. So awareness is the first thing. Secondly, being equipped to offer critique. That's really important. And I think coming along here tonight and coming to these meetings is about being equipped to be effective in the world in which we live, and effective as Christians in the world in which we live. And thirdly, to challenge. To challenge what's going on. As I was preparing this, I was thinking back to my own undergraduate days and uh, that Enlightenment dictum that's accredited to Voltaire, I don't know if it's him or not, but 
you know, uh, I will disagree with you, but I'll defend to the death your right to have your say, or something like that. That's not the exact quote. Now, that was still the case in universities 40 years ago. It's not now. You can't stand up and offer a counterpoint from the cultural stuff that's being offered because you'll be dismissed. And we need to stand up. I couldn't now be an undergraduate student in the humanities. It saddens me to say that. There is just so much junk and there's no counterpoint. And here's the irony, it's called critical thinking. <laughs> and it's no such thing. See, it's a lie, isn't it? Here's a good wee book by Jim Packer, and the late Jim Packer and Thomas Howard. Christianity, the true humanism. It's got some good, good comment and critique of Marxism there, amongst many others. I'll just mention that. John 14, 6, say with me, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life. Yeah. Better than Marxism. Better than any other system of human thought. God himself telling us he is the way, the truth, and the life. We need to be bold, stand for truth, 